There's a famous word from Ramban Nachmanides in this week's reading. Until this period of time, which was the last 10 weeks, 10 months of our stay of bondage in Egypt, the whole reality of revealed miracles on a public view did not exist. The miracle of the first plague, which was all the water in Egypt turned to blood, never ever happened before. That magnitude of miracle, the miracles, Moshe performed miracles to prove who he was, but that was limited to that particular moment. But the magnitude of the plague, where all the water in Egypt turned to blood, Egypt being the height of civilization, this became public knowledge. Every sector of humanity was aware of what took place in Egypt. And every plague was such, Egypt being the height of civilization. The 10 plagues, why did God go public? A revealed miracle is something which cannot be denied. And if you didn't do deny it, as a skeptic very often denies many things, which are reality, but even the skeptic has difficulty denying this. It's so compelling and so overwhelmingly clear it's irrefutable proof that God is the omnipotent power, the supreme power, and he dictates existence. But why now, not earlier? <coughs> so he explains, the natural order of existence <coughs> that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west, that that we exist as human beings and our human functions. When you put a seed in the ground, in soil, it germinates and starts growing. This is all nature. Seasons, that's nature. But the question is, what is the basis for nature? Is every aspect of nature an act of God? And the only reason why it's classified as nature, which comes means natural, is because God set certain systems in existence that the world should function within a certain context to be able to achieve certain values, certain goals. The world should be Productive, constructive, and not destructive. That's what it's all about. But why is it happening? Why the seasons? Why the laws of nature? Because God wills every aspect of existence. And God says it's in the best interest of existence that there should be a natural order. That things should repeat themselves day in and day out. In certain contexts, other situations are only seasonal. But why are they happening? It's no different splitting than splitting the Red Sea. There's no need to split the Red Sea every day. But there's a need for the natural order to continue 24 hours a day for the majority of this existence. That's necessary for existence. But why that natural order? What is the background, what's the backdrop of that? The backdrop is God's willing, it should be, exactly to the detail as it manifests itself. But what happened? Existence is an existence nearly 3,000 years, and people, they have their own take or their own way of processing 
the reality of their existence. And there are many positions. There's one position of paganism, of idolatry, that God is a creator. God is infinite. But God being a creator, he creates, but because of his dimension of being, he doesn't occupy himself with the minutia of existence to deal with all the daily details of what's needed and what has to be provided. So what did he do? He created the systems, he created an existence, he created angels, and he gave over the responsibility of maintaining this existence to the hosts of heaven, to the angels. There's a spiritual power behind the sun, the moon, fertility, vegetation, water. Everything has a spiritual counterpart. They're called angels. These angels are given over the full control of that particular system. If that is the case, if you want to ingratiate yourself and be worthy in the eyes of that angel, of that power, you worship it, you serve it. You put yourself out for it. You dedicate yourself to it. This is the concept of paganism. You worship deities. The deities are these powers, and they are powers, but they're powers which are not independent of God. They're manifestations of God willing their agency. And they can only function to the degree that he wills them continuously every moment. But they, because of their understanding of who God is, his dimension is infinite, not fathomable. Therefore, their takeaway is God may have created existence, but he gave over existence to the angel class, which are deities to control existence. That's their understanding. Therefore, you have natural order. You have an angel that was created for the sun. So the sun every day rises and sets. It provides the nourishment for all vegetation. It warms the earth and whatever. And everything has its function. And every angel has its function. Why is there fertility? Why is there vegetation? Why the seas? Why is the water? Salt water, fish. Everything has angels. But that's idolatry. And why did they assume this? Firstly, as I said, God is a creator. He's beyond the minutia of maintaining existence. Not only that, things just happen day in and day out, every day. He doesn't have to be involved. So he gave it over. I'll give me an example. Lahavdiya. Person has a father who's a financial genius. And he built a one-of-a-kind of business and puts in place all the various systems for this business. It could almost run by itself. And the father says to his son, and his son doesn't have a fraction of the IQ of his father and the ingenuity and the ability, innovation. And the father says to his son, he says, son, I know your limitation. I'm going on to better, better purpose. I'm giving you over the business. You just have to turn a key, everything goes by itself. Of course, all the systems are in place. The world is functioning identically the same. You just have to open the door, put on the lights, and turn the key, activate systems. That's the way it works. I don't, you don't need me for it. I already have my input here. And once it's set, it almost goes by itself. That's the understanding of the world. It goes by itself. God, the creator, is no longer involved in this. What happens after two and a half, three thousand years? All of a sudden, you see all the water in Egypt turns to blood, and it's forecasted by God's agent who proves himself to be God's agent. And sure enough, the most advanced civilization who seems to be invincible, they're brought to their knees because they have no water. Was all the water turns to blood, all the fish die in the in the Nile. What does that say? If the, only the Creator could have brought about such a thing, if only the Creator brought about it, and if seemingly the Creator abandoned 
or checked out, was no longer involved with the minutia of existence, why is he somehow revealing that he's here? You know what that re revelation is? It's called an eye opener. What we believed all along was nature natural and it happens by itself and it was given over to the host. Now, just as this event could only be brought about by the creator, identically every other nuance of existence is due to the creator willing every nuance of existence. So even the natural order is no different than the, than the revealed miracle. So in the words of Nachmanides, nature is nes nistar. It's a concealed miracle. Splitting in the sea, the plagues, this is nes goboi. That's a revealed miracle, which cannot be denied. So the revealed miracle was a revelation that even nature is miracle, meaning it's the hand of God. That's Nachmanides. Now, what happened after Egypt? There was the splitting of the sea, many things. After that, God went, out, went into concealment. What do you think is going to happen? It's like King Solomon said, what was, is, what is, will be. There's nothing new under the sun. As mankind initially believed in God and saw God's hand initially, but as time went on, people forgot. Of course, when you see something naturally reoccurring day in, day in out, you believe what you see. Evidently, God has vacated his interest in this existence. He's no longer associated. So you'll say, well, God will perform more miracles. Those level of miracles, you need a special worthiness. And not every generation is worthy that God should reveal himself in this magnitude. So what's going to happen? We fall back into this other position of believing something which is not real, which is not the reality. <coughs> so how do you prevent it? If you notice, <coughs> there are many mitzvahs. There's a central theme in the Torah. It's called Zechel Yitzis Mitzrayim. We do many things to commemorate the exodus of Egypt. Whether it's the Seder or the holiday of Pesach, Passover, the Seder, the 15th night of Nisan, we sit and there's an obligation to discuss in detail the bondage, the redemption, and to re-experience as if we ourselves are the beneficiaries of the exodus to that degree. When we say Kiddush Friday night, what do we say? Zechel Yitzis Mitzrayim. To remember the redemption from Egypt. The first of the Ten Commandments, where God spoke to the Jewish people, I'm your God, the Almighty who took you out of Egypt. Wherever we turn, we can never forget that. What do we always have to be reminded or not to forget, because it's so basic and, and, and crucial to our belief in God, that as God then made it obvious, he's involved with every nuance of existence, he has never left. So even nature is God. So not to forget that, we always have commandments which commemorate that event, and we always recall that event. We say in the third paragraph of Shema every day, I am God, I am your God who took you out of Egypt. Again, there's an obligation twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, to remember the redemption of Egypt. God says, I don't want you to forget, because if you forget, you fall back into this false position that God has abandoned and has no association with existence. That is the value of miracles. So all that we've discussed, the past portions and this portion, which led, leads to the Exodus, which ultimately we come to the magnificent miracle of the splitting of the sea, which according to one of Rabbi Akiva's opinion, there were 250 miracles that took place at the splitting of the sea.
That was the magnitude of the miracle. And after the sea closed on the Egyptian armies and destroyed them, they sang the song of the sea, articulating and detailing and delineating every aspect of what took place when the sea closed on the Egyptians. What they were saying before they went in and what they experienced as a result of the sea closing on them. And this is something we say every day. Every morning as part of the morning service, we say the Ozi Oshir. That's the, sing of, that's the song of the sea. Moshe led the men in the song, and Miriam, the sister of Moshe, led the women in the song. Every plague that took place, Pharaoh was forewarned. It's going to happen. And if you don't send the Jews out, it's going to happen. And it happened. And it repeated itself 10 times. Exactly to the detail, it happened. So let's understand something. When we make the mathematical calculation at the Seder, it's part of that Goda, and we discuss how many plagues at the splitting of the sea, how many miracles did they, did they witness? One opinion says 50 miracles. Another opinion says 200 miracles. And Rabbi Akiva's position is 250 miracles. How do we come up with the mathematics on this? Now, we find that the sorcerers of Egypt, by the third plague, which was lice, where the earth turned into lice, they said to Pharaoh, Etzba Elokimi, this is the finger of God. What happened? The first plague was all the water in Egypt turned to blood. The second plague was frogs. The frogs just teamed out of the bodies of water, covered Egypt, went into every home, into every cupboard, even went into the innards to that degree to the point where they, the people were losing their minds. Moshe prayed, they all died. Yet mounds and mounds of decaying frogs. There was a stench, it wasn't even, you couldn't breathe. That was the aftermath of the plague. But those first two plagues, the Egyptians were able to replicate. So Pharaoh says to Moshe, do you think you're gonna pull the wool over our eyes? You're bringing coals to Newcastle. This is the hub of witchcraft, of sorcery. Do you think you're going to beat us at our game? There's no way you're going to beat us at our game. So what happens? You have the third plague. Third plague is all the earth turned to lice. We know a louse is a tiny, tiny parasite. Tiny barely visible to the eye. Sorcery can only affect something which is the size of a lentil or larger. If it's smaller than a lentil, it's not subject to sorcery. So if that's the case, the earth turning to lice is a clear confirmation that this is not rooted in sorcery. The first two plagues you may say is rooted in sorcery, but the third plague, not possible. So these are the expert sorcerers say to Pharaoh, this is the real, this is the real thing. This is Etzba Elokim. This clearly points, it's the pointing finger. This is it. This is not sorcery. This is not fabrication. This is not fiction. This is reality. This is God himself. So let's understand. Etzba represents 10 plagues. So if Etzba is 10, and we find at the splitting of the sea, what did God display? Yad HaChazoka, his powerful hand. So if finger represents 10, and a hand has five fingers, it's five, five, five times 10. So that means everybody agrees at the splitting of the sea, there were minimally 50 miracles. Okay, the other say 200, because each plague was, was comprised of four miracles, so the number is 200, five miracles, it's 250, separate. 
But how do we reconcile the question? If they only recognize it was the hand of God from the third plague onward, from the lice, because it couldn't be replicated through sorcery. So Etzma is only eight, it's not 10. So how do we understand this? The answer is, The answer is, until the third plague, they believed it was sorcery because they replicated. Once the third plague happened, they, which they couldn't replicate, what did that say? In retrospect, it means even one or two is the hand of God. So when you had the third that revealed that not only those going forward is God, but even that preceded is also the act of God. As a result of this, the number three is the equivalent of 10. Because once you see God is involved, immediately uh, it dispels the issue, the issue that the first two were, were sorcery. Why did God choose 10 plagues? So the early commentators explain, we find that the number 10 <clears throat> goes back to the 10 utterance of, of God. Had an existence come about through 10 utterances. The profile of existence is 10. Through 10 utterances, all existence came. The terrestrial, the celestial, spiritual worlds is all within the context of 10. <clears throat> what is the objective of creation? Parashas Baralokim, the world was created for one objective, the fulfillment of the Torah, which is referred to as the choicest. And which nation is the only one who's qualified to receive that Torah? Only the Jewish people. So the 10 utterances initially, what was its value? to bring about Torah and the Jewish people. There should be a Sinai and they should receive it. So the objective of the 10 was ultimately it should culminate with 10 commandments. The 10 commandments is the embodiment of the Torah in its entirety, which is the objective. What do you need to facilitate that we should come about to culminate with 10th commandments. The Jews themselves at this point are idolaters because they were slaves. They have to be weaned from those idolatrous beliefs. How do you wean them? 10 plagues. Because you need the 10 to facilitate a level of advancement that they should be at a level <clears throat> to embrace and be worthy of the 10 at Sinai. That's why there were 10 plagues. Avram Avinu, Abraham, the founding patriarch of the Jewish people, <clears throat> was tested with 10 tests. Only after he was able to withstand the 10 challenges did he become the founding patriarch of the Jewish people to secure us. So all the dynamics were set once he met all 10 challenges. Why 10 challenges? Because what's the objective of the 10? To be qualified to accept the Torah, which is quantified in 10 commandments. So everything goes back to the 10 commandments. The 10 utterances, the objective is 10 commandments. So everything all along the way <clears throat> to facilitate that objective takes on the profile of 10.
know, the Egyptians, you know, a person makes a mistake, a person acts foolishly, a person doesn't process something correctly. Egypt is the most advanced civilization. Water turns to blood. It lasted for a week, reverted back to water. The earth turns to lice or frogs. Things get back to normal. You have predator animals. Things get back to normal. The people are affected with boils. Things get back to normal. Pestilence. The livestock die in the field. You have livestock which are in the barn in protected locations. Get back to normal. What happened when the hailstones came? The plague of hail. Firstly, every plague happened exactly to the detail as Moshe said it would happen. If they're obstinate, if that will, it's said of the Jewish people. So if you lose five out of five, and five out of five as were predicted, or were said it's gonna happen, happened, you don't think number six is happening. And number six is at a level of devastation. As I said, the first five plagues, they were able to recover easily. If that sixth plague comes and you have blocks of ice, which is the equivalent of meteorite, meteorites falling out in the sky with fire, everything's gonna get destroyed. Everything, could you imagine? We had the World Trade Center. Two planes crashed in, it collapsed. Could you imagine a whole country being attacked with meteorites, which each meteorite is the size of a mountain. And it was predicted all the vegetation, all the structures, all the animals, all the people are gonna be demolished. They're gonna be crushed. And there's gonna be fire, which is gonna burn it. So if Moshe himself was true to his word on the first five, don't you think number six is happening? And yet the Torah says in last week's reading, the person who feared God, he paid attention. But the person who did not fear God, he paid no attention. He left his livestock and his slaves in the field and they were all killed. How could you be so foolish? You know, it's like a person going, he says, you know, I'm not a superstitious person. And then he have an eight lane highway with traffic. Cars go 90 miles an hour. And he gets in front of the traffic, he says, you know, I do this because I'm not superstitious. So you're not superstitious. Instantaneous death. Standing in the, pre in the front of those, that traffic, you can be run over. So five out of five happened, exactly to the smallest detail. Now Moshe says, hail is coming, fire is coming, thunder is coming, which is be deafening, which will literally dismantle you emotionally, mentally, and physically. How do you not heed, heed his warning? But yet people didn't. It seems to be not a reality story. But it happened. How did it happen? So the Rachaim HaKadosh explains that it was such a thing was so remote, so far-fetched. It's something they couldn't believe. They couldn't believe it. So can you imagine, you say, whatever I've seen till now, it's the equivalent of pygmies. And you say, there could be somebody walking into town. He's about 2,000 feet tall. All I saw until now, you've shown me pygmies. It's so far-fetched, so remote. Unless you really feared God, it's not believable. Not believable. And that's what, when it happened, when it hit, the people were in literally shocked into paralysis. Everything was destroyed, all the crops, the staples of life, all that they created, all that they built within moments was destroyed. 
What does Paro say? Paro makes a declaration. Hashem atzadik, aniv ami arushoyim. God is the righteous one. I and my people are evil. Could you imagine? The monarch of the most advanced society, pagan society, makes such a declaration. God is the righteous one, and I and my people are evil. Why? Because he experienced something there which superseded anything that preceded it combined. The trauma of the noise, the crashing, the destruction, was beyond human capacity even to be able to, to process this. What happens? See, he begs, he begs Moshe, pray to God, it should stop. Moshe immediately goes and prays and stops. What happens? Powers up to his own shenanigans. I will not send you out. Why? It's just because God hardened his heart. So the obvious question is, even if God hardens Pharaoh's heart, but Pharaoh, if you would say to Paro, if you don't listen to me, I will pull the trigger. And Paro knows there's a bullet in that chamber. As much as you're on this heart, the man has to be insane not to do what the person says he should do. After the plague of hail, after he, see, he sees God's power, how do, you, how do you change your mind? How do you behave this way? This is very interesting. After the plague of hail, he took, he made an assessment. He assessed the damage. He found something very interesting. Everything was destroyed except for the wheat and the spelt crop. So Parah had a question. If God is the almighty, why didn't destroy the spelt and wheat? There's one answer. Because God is not the supreme master of, of existence. He's a power. But he's not all powerful. He's not almighty. Because if he was almighty, he would have destroyed the wheat and, crop and the spelt, which is the staple of life. That proves to me, as painful as the destruction was, I'm not submitting to him. I am still Pharaoh. I am Pharaoh. I will not let the people out. That's why he, he, he put up this resistance. Because what was the alternative? The alternative at this point is what? Egypt now being in shambles, reduced to rubble. What's the only chance of recovery? You have a slave population. That's the financial backbone of the country. They will enable you to rebuild the country. But if the Jews leave now, how do we get back to ourselves? So therefore, under no circumstance will he let the Jews leave. He's not letting them go. Because if they go, the future is hopeless. If they're here, we talk about a future. We could rebuild. And what was the proof of the pudding? Because if God is the Almighty, why did he destroy the wheat and spelt crop? That clearly says the God of the wheat and spelt was able to stand up against the God of the Jews. But little did he know this is going to be the rude awakening in the ultimate sense. God says, what you believe is security is full security because the next plague that's coming is going to be the locust. And what you think is yours in a moment, it's gone. Because the locusts are going to come and it's going to be such a wave of locusts. It's never ever happened in Egypt. It will never ever happen again. Everything will be devoured, including the wheat, including the spelt. All of a sudden, now the question is, does he believe it's going to happen? Maybe yes, maybe no. Pharaoh says, you're not going out. You're not going out. I'm willing to take my chance. As initially you couldn't destroy the wheat and spelt, the locusts will not be able to eat that wheat and spelt. 
because the god of the wheat and spelt will stand up to the god of the Jews, not allow it to happen. Okay? God says to Moshe, raise up your hand. All of a sudden, an eastern wind brings a locust that they cover the sky, that the, the sun couldn't even penetrate the covering of the locust. It was like night. I guess what? The wheat is the first thing they start destroying. The so-called secure, security blanket, all of a sudden, in a moment, is gone. What does Pharaoh say? Remove this death from me. This is the beginning of the end. After this, there's nothing left. Unless we stop the locust in their tracks, there's no future. It'll become an arid desert. Moshe says, I'll pray. Immediately prays. As the wind brought them in, the wind blew them out. That there wasn't even one locust left. Even the locust that they, they sold in their tails, because the locust was a, a delicacy, even those were not left, they shouldn't be able to have any benefit from. Even those were blown out. What happens after that happens? We survived. We're still here. There's still remnants of that wheat. Because Moshe prayed. So Paro is playing this game as long as he can play the game. Okay? Meantime, you people are not going. We're alive. We're surviving. It's okay. What happens? There's a plague of darkness. Six days. The first three days of darkness was just darkness. Meaning, even if you try to create light, you couldn't create light. Meaning, the intensity of the darkness was so tense, light could not penetrate that, that darkness. It's like if you ever drive through a, a fog, which we used to refer to as pea soup, the headlights cannot penetrate that fog. That's how thick the fog is. The intensity of the darkness was so intense that light could not penetrate the darkness. So here the darkness is not an absence of light. The darkness was a reality. And therefore there was the light. So three days they were in the dark. The next three days, darkness took on a physical form. They were actually cemented into their locations. Could you, like, imagine, take black clay and put it around them, and they're literally cemented in their places. As if a person was standing, he couldn't sit. If he was lying, he couldn't stand. This was for an additional three days. That's the plague of darkness. Why did God bring a plague of darkness upon the Egyptians? So the Midrash says for two reasons. The Jews, before we left Egypt, we had to borrow the valuables of the Egyptians, the silver, gold goblets, and all the personal effects. You go to the Egyptian and you say, uh, could you lend me a gold goblet? He says, I wish I could, I don't have it. The silver goblet, I wish I could, but I don't have it. The Jews, during the days of darkness, they were told to go through the houses of all the Egyptians, search through those houses you know exactly where the values are located. So when you ask to borrow, and they say they don't have it, you say, by the way, I saw it, you have it. And it's located in such and such a location. As a result of that, they'll be forced to release all their valuables to you. That's one of the reasons, one of the values of darkness. The other value of darkness was 80% of the Jews perished during the days of darkness. They died. Why did they die? Because these Jews were not interested in leaving Egypt. Weren't interested. They didn't have sufficient, sufficient faith in God that he will take care of them when they go into the desert. If that's the case, God says, we leave no survivors behind. You, want, you have faith to leave, go into the desert, fine. If not, you perish. If the Egyptians would have been aware that the Jews are dying as they're dying, the effect of the plague would be minimized. Because they say, look, 
If this is the God of the Jews, why are Jews dying? So since it was done during the days of darkness, the Egyptians were not aware that the Jews were the victims during this period of time. So it was concealed from them. They didn't know. That was the double value of the darkness to, to conceal this fact that the Jews perished during this time period also. That's the reason. Now, you know, you can't beat God at his game as much as you think you could. Now, some people, you have a robot, which is, is a computer, and you want to play chess against the robot. You can't outwit the, the computer, but maybe you could, because the computer is only as good as the one who programs the computer. But Lahavdil, one, one you can't, there's one entity you can't outwit, that's God. I'll give you an example. We find that when the Egyptians killed the male children, the newborns, Paro gives the order, you should kill them by drowning them. Not through the sword, not through the fire, just take them, throw them into the Nile. Why? Why did he choose that manner of murder through genocide, through water, and not through fire, not through the sword? So the Midrash says, because he made a calculation, he says, the God of the Jews, again, he's not the supreme power. Whenever he responds and reacts against his enemies, it's always measure for measure. So if we kill the Jews by the sword, he will kill us by the sword. If we kill them by fire, he will kill us by fire. But if we kill him then by water, we've tied his hands. Why have we tied his hands? Because God made a covenant with existence that he will never ever bring a great flood upon the world. And since Egypt is the height of civilization, destroying Egypt through water would be the equivalent of destroying existence. Therefore, we outwitted God. We outsmarted him. We tied his hands. He's not able to punish us measure for measure. But you realize, as I said, you can't beat God. God said, as I said, I will never bring water upon the earth again to destroy it. What about if you go into the water? The water's not coming to you, but you go in there. Now, how do you get the Egyptians into the water? Very simple. You have the Jews borrowing their personal effects, the gold, silver vessels. And they're taking only on loan not as a gift to be returned. Not to be, only as a, only as a loan to return. The Jews said we're going for three days. After three days, they realized they're not coming back. So what are they? They were duped. They were deceived. The last remnant of value was taken from them. What did they do? They began pursuing the Jews. But if the Jews wouldn't have taken their personal valuables, the Egyptians wouldn't have pursued the Jews. God says, I punish measure for measure. As you killed my children by water, you will die through water. So how do you get them into the water? Very simple. God orchestrated it. You borrow from them and tell them for three days. And when they realize you're not coming back, they're going after you people. And when they go after you, they're going to go into the sea and the sea will close on them. That's measure for measure. As you killed my children with water, you will drown through water. That's the measure for measure. As I say, you can't out with God. Lovan was known as the charlatan, the ultimate deceiver. He cheated his son-in-law a hundred times. <coughs> he should have left penniless when he left with his family. He left a wealthy man. Why did he leave a wealthy man? Of course, Yaakov understood that if God's on your side, no one can out with God. No one. And the deal that he cut was a miraculous deal. When Yaakov said to love, and after he caught up with him, he says, what do you want from me? And he explained to him, whatever he has is legitimately his, legally his. 
So what do you think of Avon says? After Avram, Yaakov proves to him that he has nothing of his and whatever he has, he rightfully earned through his sweat and blood. And how he's cheated a hundred times. I love him. He says, your children are my children. Your daughters are my daughters. Your flocks are my flocks. Your herds are my herds. End of the story. But how can he say it? They, they cut a deal. The speckled, spotted sheep are yours. Yeah, you know something? These Jews, they're just unbelievable. The way the Gentile sees the Jew. They're unbelievable connivers. I agree to this deal if your profit would be 20%, 50%, 100%. But hundreds of thousands of percent of profit? If I knew that was the deal, I would have never agreed to it. You pulled the wool over my eyes. That's what loving. That's how loving in his warped mind was able to justify coming after him and even destroying Yaakov, if not for God's intervention. Who would have believed? No, people are impressed easily, especially with power. Power impresses people. See a person who has wealth, has power, he's able to move mountains, you're impressed. Why impressed? Because very few people could do what this person could do. But if you really understand the only reason why the person could do it is only because <coughs> there's somebody behind him. <coughs> then you're not as impressed as you normally would be impressed. We say on Roshani Yom Kippur in the liturgy of the prayer, who is God? God is mamlich malochim v'lo amalucha. God coronates kings. But who's the king? God is the king himself. Paro in the seat of the throne of kingship. You're there only as, God, as long as God allows you to be there. The moment he wants to remove you from that throne, you're out. See, even when you seem on the throne, what did the story of Egypt reveal? You're there because you're God's puppet. You're only as good as God wants you to be. The moment God says it's over, it's over. And that's that's the lesson we have to learn. We learned by, we saw by the midwives. Why were the midwives not in intimidated by the king of Egypt? Because Because they feared God and they understand who God was. Therefore, the king of Egypt meant nothing. Because you're only the king of Egypt because God put you there. And if you internalize that reality, anything you say doesn't impress me, doesn't intimidate me. Because my breadwinner is God, not you. And you, as much as you believe it's you, it's God. Therefore, when you do tell me to do something which is contrary to the will of God, it doesn't mean anything. We will stop here. Second.